All right, so today we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of key mechanics uh, that make Left 4 Dead tick. So first of all, a quick overview of Left 4 Dead for those of you not familiar with the game. Left 4 Dead is a replayable cooperative survival horror game where four survivors work together to escape environments swarming with murderously enraged infected, otherwise known as zombies. <clears throat> so we have the survivor team. We have different mechanics that they can use to, to work together, which we'll talk about in some more detail. Their, their enemies include the enraged infected mob, just hundreds and hundreds of enraged running zombies that chase down the survivors at every turn. Special infected, we have the, let's see if this works here, smoker, the boomer, and the hunter. We'll talk about them in a little bit. And then the boss infected, which are the most difficult challenges, the tank, and the witch. Survivors make their way through hostile environments, running into various creatures along the way, like uh, someone here who has set off the witch and is undoubtedly going to be sorry in a, in a moment or two. Dealing with you know, huge hordes of zombies, ultimately reaching an extraction point where there's some sort of rescue vehicle that comes to pick them up and take them away to safety. Unfortunately, the game is sort of like an evil Gilligan's Island. They never really escape. <laughs> Something always happens, and they're, they're back at it again. All right, so why did Valve decide to pursue Left 4 Dead? We have a number of other intellectual properties. Why did we decide to create a new one? Well, we saw a perceived gap in the market for cooperative gaming. I mean, anecdotally, as gamers, we're always talking about how we wish there were more cooperative games that we could play together. So that was sort of the major risk of the project. That's what, what we decided to take head on. It's like, let's, let's really focus on something that's really cooperative and explore whether this is an interesting market segment. Valve has experience in creating single-player games that are fairly epic in scale, like the Half-Life series. <coughs> and then multiplayer games we know from experience build community, like Team Fortress or, or, or uh, Counter-Strike. And by the, doing this community building, uh, we end up having long-term retail sales. Counter-Strike 1.6 in its original form is still selling as we speak. We also have some unique experience with online multiplayer AI technology with what we did with uh, Counter-Strike and the Counter-Strike bot for Condition Zero and for Counter-Strike Source. So the idea was to combine these, these things together and create some sort of fusion of multiplayer single-player narrative sort of game uh, and see what we can come up with in the co-op space and explore it. So how do we do this? So we focused on two major things. One is we're going to require cooperation. We really want to get crisp data. This is our primary focus. If we make a game that, doesn't, that you can succeed that doesn't require cooperation, we haven't learned anything. So we decided that this game is going to have, you're going to have to cooperate with the other members of the team to win, and that will tell us clearly whether cooperative gaming is going to work for us. The second thing we really focused on is replayability. Um, again, we, we, we treat gaming as a service, again, coming back to things like Team Fortress, where we put a game out and we keep working on it. We keep adding content. We keep trying to build the community and growing and growing and growing and get that long, continuous uh, retail sales going. So we wanted to focus on that as well with Left 4 Dead. All right, so let's dive into these in a little more detail. So requiring cooperation. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to, we need to encourage cooperation throughout the game design. It can't be something that works for a single player, as a single player game, that we say, hey, let's, let's put more players into it. We wanted to structure the game from the ground up to require cooperation. What's, what's important about that is we really need to ensure that the only way to win, for the players to perceive that they can win the game, is to walk, cooperate. If the players can find a way that they can win at the expense of their friends, they will. And throughout the design process, we treated the entire survivor team as the player. So we could be a little harsh on one guy as long as the whole team didn't die. 
we had me mechanics by which you could save that guy, which you could bring that guy back, etc. You could even maybe lose two guys, um, but it, the focus was on the whole survivor team as the player. To further make sure the cooperative nature worked, we penalized non-cooperative behavior very harshly and very simply. If you abandon the team, you die. That was, that was the rule. Now, the trick is with both these things, if we were really explicit about it and heavy-handed, players would rebel. They would feel like they're just being forced to do things that they don't want to do. So we needed to find design solutions that seemed to fit naturally in the environment and encourage them, make them want to do the right thing without feeling like they're forced to do the right thing. So we didn't have any you know, invisible leashes where you, you couldn't go beyond a certain distance from your teammates and it just would stop you. We didn't have anything like that. We decided on survival horror as a genre because it was an excellent fit for these constraints because everybody knows the rules. It's a well-established genre. Everyone's seen at least one zombie movie or something similar like Aliens, etc., right? Everyone knows the rules. The good guys work together. If there's any jerks in the team that try to abandon the team for their own benefit, they die in some horrible, awful fashion. And the enemies are always ruthless and nearly unstoppable. So by framing the game in that context, when players come into the game, they've already sort of bought in to what we're trying to accomplish halfway. So as long as the game doesn't break that, they'll fit right in those roles and we're off, we're off to the races. Okay, so the enemy design also totally pushed on cooperation. Right at the outset, the horde itself, the you know, thousands of zombies all throughout the environment, when a player enters Left 4 Dead for the first time and gets out into an environment where they can see for a bit, it's very clear there is no way that they're going to take out all of those enemies on their own and survive. Most people think that, at least. So that, like, implicitly tells them, I need to stay with these guys. They've got to watch my back. I'm totally outnumbered here. So we were able to right away sort of lay the framework there as well without requiring some sort of game like leash or something on them to keep to keep them together. In addition, we did some subtle things like like when the infected actually hit you and do some damage, they stop you. So if you're really nimble with the controls and think you can duck and move and weave through all the infected, well you can until you miss one. And then all the guys you ran past and woke up, they're all going to catch up to you and you will uh, you'll be sorry. So again, this enforces cooperation in an implicit manner. So in addition, we have a special infected. That was the, the smoker, the hunter, and the boomer. Uh, they each have special abilities. They're a little tougher. They basically add spice. So we've got the sort of baseline gameplay of the infected horde out there that you're just trying to survive against. And then we have the spice of the special infected that m mix things up in specific ways, explicitly uh, the ways that we explicitly added to address gameplay issues we saw during playtesting. <clears throat> Which, by the way, I can't stress enough how important playtesting is. This game started out uh, in a world full of gray boxes. Don't press that button. All right. This world started out as a world full of gray boxes, and it got pretty fun as a world full of gray boxes. And if you can make a world full of gray boxes fun, then you know you got something, something good. So anyway, special infected. So they had some spice, and they, and they addressed specific gameplay issues. Each of the special infected also has an overwhelming attack that's going to incapacitate or totally overwhelm at least one survivor, which is going to require some interesting choices to be made by that player and the rest of his teammates. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. All right, so the first one is the hunter. <clears throat> so the hunter can pounce huge distances. If he lands on a survivor, he pins them to the ground, they are helpless, and he just starts shredding them. And that player will die unless a teammate comes to their aid and saves them. <clears throat> so the, the, the hunter is very nimble. Uh, he can get on rooftops. He can scale walls. He can pretty much go anywhere. The reason he exists is to outrun and kill stragglers. If anybody gets past all of the things I've already said and tries to run off on their own and run ahead, the hunter's job is supposed to be to catch that guy and take him out. And if that happens and he's way out of position, there's no way that he's going to survive before the team gets to him. The second special effect is the smoker. The smoker has a 50-yard long prehensile tongue. He can shoot it out, grab a survivor, 
and pull that survivor to him. So the smoker can use this to pull a survivor way out of position or to hang them from a high ledge like a rooftop or something like this. <clears throat> so this was added for two reasons. One is similar to, to the hunter. We want to keep people on their toes. But mainly, we had a situation early on in playtesting where <clears throat> uh, survivor teams that were really disciplined and basically moved through the world like a SWAT team tended to damp down their own drama because they just handled everything. So we added the smoker to make sure every now and then their perfect little plan was messed up. That, you know, as good as they were doing, one of them is going to get pulled way over here, and then they get that moment, which is actually really exciting, that they were denying themselves of, you know, oh my God, Joe's over there, what do we do? Ah. The boomer. So the boomer is a hugely obese zombie that if you shoot him, he explodes, splatters gore everywhere, or he can projectile vomit and hit you with his, his vomit. If either of those things happen and you're getting that stuff on you, a huge horde of zombies is generated and they chase down you. <clears throat> so the original purpose of the boomer was to break the rule of shoot everything that moves. So before we had threats like the boomer, again, players would just, anything that moved in the environment, just blam, 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 blam. And it became very mechanical in some ways. Uh, by adding threats like the boomer, as soon as you hear them in the area, you have, to, you have to change up your thinking. You have to keep track of what's going on. You hesitate with some of your shots. Sometimes that's bad. Sometimes that's good. <clears throat> and then, of course, the, uh, the vomit explosion hitting someone creates excellent moments of, of what I'm calling dramatic anticipation. And we'll talk about that in more detail. How am I doing here? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so special effect of incapacitating attacks. <clears throat> when one of these guys incapacitates another survivor, it does several things for us. One of the big things is, is it makes players fear being separated from the group, which automatically reinforces team cohesion, just automatically. <clears throat> uh, however, the interesting thing was that it gives players, you know, who aren't the victim, the chance to be the hero for the moment. And perhaps, perhaps I'm jaded from years of Counter-Strike online playing, but um, surprisingly, players really like to help each other. So when someone's down like that, and another player goes over and helps them out, helps them back up to their feet, that's like really positive. That was a huge driving force for the players of the Survivor team. And brought in lots of um, non-traditional players of various, of various walks of life. Who, all, who found different ways to enjoy the game because of mechanics like this. And the boss infected. Um, yeah. So they, they, they really are the, spe specifically Tank, here, let's talk about in a moment, uh, they do create the, the oh, oh snap moments. <laughs> so <clears throat> what are they here for, really? So the boss infected force the survivors immediately to reevaluate their tactics. So they may have sort of gotten into their pacing, they're moving through the world, they're doing pretty well, everyone's sort of figured out their roles, etc. Uh, and then the music swells and here comes a tank and he's barreling down. And because of the procedural way things are populated, which we'll also talk about, uh, the team has to react right now. It's like, oh God, it's the tank. The thing that's cool about that not only because it breaks up the, the, the pacing, but it forces the survivors to immediately talk to each other. All right, what are we going to do? Who's going to go where? And that kind of communication and working together, again, uh, reinforces what we want, which is cooperation. So the tank. <clears throat> so the tank is hugely muscled beast of a zombie. Um, and what he does is he halts the forward momentum of the survivors and requires them all to focus their attention on the tank. If, if the team doesn't, ideally, if they don't focus their attention on the tank and they get split up or someone decides to run for it or they attack the tank in ones or twos or whatever, things generally go very badly for the team. They really all need to focus down, work together, and take out the tank. Uh, it puts the survivors into a defensive posture instead of an offensive posture. Up until this point, they've been moving through the world trying to reach the escape point. Now they need to change up, find a place to, to battle the tank and let him come to them. In addition, the tank forces them to totally reevaluate their environment. 
for example, in uh, dead air, there is a parking garage. So the survivors may be working their way through this dark parking garage full of cars parked. And <clears throat> everything seems to be going all right, and then they hear the tank. Arr! You immediately look around and realize that tank could throw every one of these cars that I'm surrounded by. That creates a huge, dramatic moment. <clears throat> but it makes the survivors totally reevaluate the environment that they're in in a different way than they just were. The witch. She's another one that breaks the rule of shoot everything that moves, but she does it with a higher contrast than the boomer does. The boomer can make a mistake. Boom, he pops. One or more people get coated in vomit. Bad things happen. Mob comes in. It's difficult, but survivable. The witch. Um, if you make a mistake with the witch, someone's probably going to die. Now, how the witch works is <clears throat> she basically sits wherever she happens to be and cries. And that's it. If you leave her be, that's all that ever happens. However, if you shine your flashlight on her, if you get too close to her, if you touch her, if you shoot her, if you make loud noises next to her, she's kind of like your mom with a migraine. Just leave her alone. Don't press that button. All right. So if you disturb her, she's going to get angry. And if she gets really angry, she's going to go off on the person that pissed her off. She's going to come out with claws flailing, and one swipe, that person is down for the count. So the thing that's cool about the witch is that crying, that sobbing of hers is, is loud and echoes for quite a ways. Plus, we've got music that builds up proportionally to how close you are to the witch. So the survivors will be fighting along, and someone will say, wait, I think I hear something, and then they hear this quiet sobbing. And then it totally switches up the pacing again. So now, instead of this defensive thing we have with, with the tank, <clears throat> it becomes kind of a stealth game. It's like, okay, where is the witch? I want to shut off your flashlight. All right, move closely. You know, watch out what you're doing. You got to really watch every bullet uh, with the witch. So she's sort of an ideal case of dramatic ant anticipation. Further enhancing cooperation, uh, we have a whole uh, whole vocalization system. Vocalization system is something that we really explored uh, in a lot of depth with Left 4 Dead, and it's, there's a ton of potential there. Um, for instance, there's a lot of like a lot of fan sites uh, talk about you know all the stuff that Francis hates, except for vests. Francis likes vests. You know, in any other kind of sort of online shooter, you'd never you'd never know. We were able to establish personality with the characters. There's a whole bunch of narrative, interesting stuff that came from that. However, the original goal of the vocalizations were things like situational awareness. We knew it was going to be really chaotic. So we have various vocalizations like, like behind you, for example, right? Like we have the code for my avatar, if I'm looking at your player and I can see your player is facing this way and there's something running up behind you, then my player will automatically yell out, behind you, which has the effect of everyone going, huh, which if everyone does that isn't always good, but you get the idea. Uh, other things that, that happen, Hunter's got Zoe, so if a hunter pounces on somebody, Usually, you know, it's loud, people know what's going on, but every now and then there's chaos. You know, someone could be just around the corner or behind the team a little bit. Having that reinforcement of one of the characters yell out, you know, Lewis is down, makes you look around, where is Lewis? Oh, I better save him. In addition, we use the vocalization system to communicate short-term goals, which helps the whole team understand what they're supposed to be doing together. Like you start, in, you start in No Mercy and a couple of characters will say, hey, you know, I think there's a subway down the street. We should get off this roof and, and get down to the subway. And then as you're working through the environment, as you get closer, one of them will say, oh, that subway's just around the corner. So you know you're on the right track, you're going the right direction. And then, of course, when the rescue vehicle at the end arrives, like on the No Mercy rooftop, top, it's a loud yell of get to the choppa. Another subtle thing that the vocalizations do is that they encourage cooperation through a sort of baseline of camaraderie. Now, if, if, you've, if you've ever gamed online using voice, occasionally you run into characters who are less than civil. <laughs> so this sort of helps to combat that in some ways, in that it's sort of lays a foundation of these characters kind of know each other already. They, 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 they care about each other, you know, not like stupid touchy-feely, but like, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to help each other. 
And then in moments where, you know, someone's laying incapacitated on the ground and your character comes over and you help them up, they're like, oh, I got you, man, it'll be all right, you know. And that we found is just like it, it's, it sort of puts people in the, mi- in the right mindset for working together. All right. <clears throat> so a couple other in- interesting things that uh, we discovered through this process. Um, limiting resources, limiting critical resources, actually is, encourages cooperation, which might be counterintuitive. Maybe it's not. I, I thought it was interesting. Um, for instance, Zoe's got you know the, the first aid kit here. At the beginning of each map and at, at each safe house along the way, and there's only like there's there's five maps in a campaign, so there's only the start and there's four safe points. So these these first aid kits are in very rare supply. There are four of them. We don't give them to each character at the beginning. They're laid out on the table. So you could be a jerk, right? You could rush into the next safe house and heal yourself up mostly. Grab another health kit and heal yourself up some more, right? But it's fractional, so the return's not very good on it. But you could do that, right? <clears throat> also, we give you mechanics to heal each other. It's very easy. You, you equip your health kit, walk up to a buddy, and hold your right mouse button down, and you just you heal them the same way you'd heal yourself with the left mouse button. <clears throat> what's, what's interesting is because we structured the game such that it's pretty obvious to everybody that they're not gonna, they can't survive alone. They have to have friends around. Uh, people actually share these resources, Readily. Um, the other nice thing about this is it really breaks the ice. When you match, when you match make a game of Left 4 Dead into a group of random people on the internet you don't know, uh, the first time some guy comes up to you and heals you when your health is low, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. You're like, oh, that guy's, that guy's all right. <laughs> and this is yet another opportunity for players to directly help each other, which players seem to like. So another similar situation, um, if we put a player in a, in a clearly helpless and totally dependent situation, totally drives cooperation. So there's several ways this can happen in Left 4 Dead. This is uh, Bill, uh, incapacitated on the ground. Uh, I don't believe I mentioned this, but in Left 4 Dead, if your health goes to zero, you don't just die. You collapse on the ground incapacitated and you bleed out over many seconds. Um, so during that time, your, your, your friends could come help you back to your feet, or they can let you, they can leave you for dead. <clears throat> so that's one way you can be in, in, uh, incapacitated. It's being hung by a smoker tongue is another way you can be, you can hang off of ledges, etc. But it's very clear to your team that that guy is totally done unless I go help him. Uh, but it's effective for a lot of the same reasons that limited, the limited resources are. All right, so let's talk about replayability a bit. How do we ensure replayability? We have this, we want to create this sort of um, single player-esque pseudo-narrative thing. How do, we, how, do we, how do we do that in such a way <clears throat> that it's not the same thing every time, that is, that, that is fresh every time you play in a way like, say, Counter-Strike is? So one way, uh, one of the techniques we're using is what I'm calling dramatic anticipation. So very simply, if event X happens and it implies event Y after a short delay, that seems more dramatic, more exciting than if just event X happened alone. So this notion of anticipation of incoming either reward or punishment seems to be really, really strong. And we use this throughout the game in countless, countless ways. So we have a clear example here of the old boomer versus new boomer. So the, the original boomer design had some flaws. <clears throat> so originally the boomer was a bomb. So when you shot the boomer, he just, just, boom, he just exploded and dealt huge amounts of damage to anyone nearby. Now that totally solved the goal of making you think before you shoot when a boomer is around. Um, but it had a real problem with new players. So, you know, if three of you knew how to play the game, and a fourth guy, like you bring your fourth guy in as your buddy, and you want to play Left 4 Dead with him, and he's never played the game before, he turns the corner, bang, whole team's dead. They tended to harass that guy a little bit. So, I mean, it was dramatic, can't argue with that, but uh, it has some problems. So what we did is, we also had another, another creature at that time called the Screamer, um, who was, he was a guy in a, in a straitjacket, 
So he couldn't attack at all. He'd stand out in the street and he'd wander around. But if he saw you, he'd freeze. And then if you didn't take him out, he would run off and scream. And when he screamed, it brought, you know, all hell broke loose and everything came to got you. That guy had all sorts of uh, discoverability issues trying to make people notice him and understand what he did and everything else. So we basically merged the two together. So the boomer, instead of just exploding as a bomb, now exploded as this bag of gore that attracted the zombies. What we discovered in the process is that the difference between bang, a whole bunch of damage to you, and pla, here's this vomit on you, and then, oh my gosh, in about three to five seconds, I am in big trouble, was actually way cooler. Right? Like, the explosion was nice. I mean, it was, you know, it, it, it was definitely exciting, but the, the knowing that you know, something, like, I just made a mistake, and then the music swells, and you hear the shriek of the mob, and then you hear them running in, and they're all coming at you, was far more uh, exciting. Another good example is, um, say you're playing sports, and uh, bam, you get hit in the mouth, tooth gets knocked out. You know, that, that, that probably smarted a bit, probably surprised you. Um, but compare that to waiting in the dentist's office for a root canal and hearing the drill and imagining the Novocaine shot and all that good stuff. It just kind of draws out the fun. All right. <laughs> so, as I said, we use this all throughout Left 4 Dead. Um, a few examples. Infected breaking through doors. Uh, all, almost all the doors in the game, the, the, the infected, they can't open doors, but they'll bash on them. And, the, you know, the door will start to splinter, break apart. Now here they come. Oh, my gosh, get ready. We talked about the boomer, the tank. So the, the tank always spawns. We try to spawn him far away from wherever the team is. So you hear him yell. You hear his huge footsteps coming in, and the music is swelling and everything else. Uh, we talked about the witch. Uh, music is a good example. There's so many things I'd love to talk about. There's just not enough time. But we did a lot of things with, with uh, interactive sort of dramatic music uh, in, in Left 4 Dead that are, are really interesting. And there's just many places where the music for the event precedes the event by several seconds. And even if you don't know what that music means, you know something bad is about to happen. Um, incoming mobs, of course. Uh, ledge hanging is classic. I mean, it's, it's the cliffhanger. Uh, and car alarms are another good example. So if you see a car alarm out in the street... So by the way, if you set off a car alarm, it's going to attract just massive amounts of, of, of zombies, and they're going to come rush you, right? So once you know this, you see a car alarm out in the street, and there's all this... Anxiety is anticipation of, oh, there's a car alarm. Gosh, I don't, hope I don't touch it. Hope I don't shoot it. Then you think, oh, I hope the team doesn't shoot it. And tell a team. And then you, you make it all, almost all the way around. Something happens. Someone shoots a car alarm. It goes off. Then there's that moment where you just hear the car alarm and it's totally silent. You're like, ah. Oh. And then shriek and then run for your life. And so it's sort of a double, double piece of anticipation. I, I like car alarms. So they're the classic. The, this, this screenshot is... Um, Ancient, but it's one of those that still gets, still shows up in press, and I would argue it's because of this dramatic anticipation. She's hanging from a ledge, the zombies below her. It tells a good story. All right, so moving on. Uh, one of the things that we do for dramatic potential, um, something I call structured unpredictability. The basic idea is that we have collections of interesting possibilities that we create sort of libraries of possibilities. We select them at runtime using intentionally designed randomized constraints. So basically we've got, you know, ranges of, of times when things could potentially happen. We've got sets of them that pick from collections of interesting possibilities and they're populated in that manner. The key thing though, I, I would say to take from this is low probability plus high drama equals memorable, right? So. What, what I've seen a lot is, is especially in, in a single-player um, sort of, of game design, designers want, to, want the player to experience every single bit of coolness that they have created every time they play. And with what we do with Left 4 Dead, we try to actively avoid that. We try to set up a whole bunch of interesting things that can happen, but any given run, they probably won't. But what's especially cool about that is they can juxtapose, they can shuffle around, they may even stack on top of each other. And when those things do, especially if they're low probability things, that's where you get the crazy stories, right? 
And what's interesting is that, is that just human nature is to remember the hits and forget the misses. So if we can we construct the system in such a way that even the sort of worst possible game is still pretty compelling, and then all of the potential games above that are really interesting, and some of them are totally awesome. The ones that people are going to talk about on the forums are the ones that are totally awesome. Dude, that time, man, we were together in the smoker, and he pulls you over here, and then oh, boomer, and then the mob, and while we're doing that, and the tank, and you hit that car, and, oh, man. <laughs> That's what we want. All right. So adaptive dramatic pacing. This is a good chunk of what the AI director is. So <clears throat> this is algorithmically adjusting game pacing on the fly to maximize drama. And I'm using drama really loosely here. Uh, if there's any like drama students in the audience, I apologize. This is like huge, broad strokes of this is exciting and this is less exciting. <clears throat> so this originally was inspired by observations from Counter-Strike. Uh, so from our years of developing Counter-Strike, the natural pacing of a CS game is very spiky. So there, there's periods of, of quiet tension punctuated by unpredictable moments of intense combat, right? So you, you start out and everyone rushes for, you know, the meat grinder spot where they know everyone's going to meet. There's a big gunfight, bang, 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 and then some people die, and then there's some stragglers that move off, and then things get quiet again. Hey, they go this way, and oh, there's a bridge, ah, and there's a big firefight, and then they're quiet again, and then, oh, they planted the bomb, let's go, you know, this sort of thing. So there's these peaks and valleys of experience. Also, <clears throat> constant unchanging combat is fatiguing. I think that's clear. One knows this. Long periods of inactivity are boring. If you got that one counter-terrorist and that one terrorist that just are both not finding each other, everyone is pulling their hair out, let's move on. The key thing, though, is that these peaks and valleys need to be unpredictable. If you knew exactly where they're going to happen every time, it loses its punch. That's the main thing. Also, same scenario, often the same map, but as long as what happens on the map is different and compelling every time, it's great. I can safely say that DE Dust has been played millions of times at this point. And it's still being played millions of times. And it, you know, it's, not, it's not because you know, sightseeing in DE Dust is just awesome. It's because the gameplay that happens there. So in Left 4 Dead, the AI director algorithmically drives the overall pacing. It creates peaks and valleys of, intent, of intensity similar to what we see with Counter-Strike. How do we do this? So the pacing algorithm is surprisingly simple. We estimate the emotional intensity of each survivor. Again, emotional intensity is you know, a loose term here. Uh, we track the maximum value of each of those four survivors' intensity. And if that intensity is too high, then we remove all the major threats for a while. Otherwise, we create an interesting population of threats. How do we estimate this emotional intensity? We tried several things. Um, and as I'm sure you've, you've found, the more clever you get, the more complicated and worse things end up. What we found is the simplest thing that worked really effectively is basically if a survivor gets hurt, their intensity goes up. That's pretty much it. There's some other edge cases there, but you know, raise the intensity of the survivor proportional to the damage that they took. Uh, decay of the survivor, uh, survivor's intensity towards zero over time. So if nothing's happening, they're, they're relaxing. Um, but don't do that if there's active infected in the area because they're still dealing with those threats. So then the AI, AI director will use that, that intensity value to modulate the infected population. And it does this through this little state machine. It's got these four states. <clears throat> so build up is the default state, and that's where the director is just doing its full population of threats. Um, once this, uh, the maximum survivor intensity crosses that threshold, it goes into a state we call sustained peak. Just basically, it it's holds for three to five seconds to try to make sure that whatever it is that got them into the situation is resolving itself. That turned out not to be enough, so we added peak fade, which basically monitors that and makes sure that it doesn't start the relax phase until everything is resolved. What we found early on with this is that in really bad situations, the survivors uh, would still be fighting and finishing up what got them in trouble in the first place and use up this whole relax period, which I'll talk about here in a moment. 
and next thing they know, they'd be back and build up, and another mob would come, and it was bad. <clears throat> Finally, after peak fade, which basically means after whatever they were currently involved in has resolved itself, goes into relax mode. And relax mode just maintains a minimal threat population. Uh, in this case, we used uh, 30 to 45 seconds. It seemed to be a good value for a lull in the action. Or until the survivors have traveled far enough towards the next safe room. Um, players are pretty smart. They figure things out. Uh, like, hey, it seems pretty quiet. I think the director's in a relaxed mode. Let's run. So we mark the spot where that, that happens. And if they go too far, then we put them back into buildup anyway. All right, so what do these mean? Buildup is full population. You get wandering infected everywhere. Uh, you get mobs of infected that come out of the corners. Uh, you get special, special infected. Relax mode is a minimal threat population. There's no wanderers until the team has calmed way down. <clears throat> no mobs at all and no special infected. Now, boss encounters are not, infect, not affected by this. Boss encounters you'll see are populated in a different way and they're few and far between and their encounters are so important that we, that we found that we, just, we need to leave them be. When we tried to modulate them with this pacing algorithm, the worst case game was bad in that the bosses would always get pushed off and they would just never have a boss battle. <clears throat> the nice thing about this system is that because it's based on the survivor's actions, it helps to make sure the game is different every time in a really sort of gross overall sense. All right, so hopefully you can see this. This is a procedurally generated population where the little white dots are common zombies. Uh, the red guy's a boomer, yellow guy's a smoker, there's a hunter, big green guy's a tank, and these big blobs of infected are mobs. <clears throat> so this would be time starting here, the survivors moving through space, they encounter a boomer, some wanderers, etc. So this is, this is the population that they would see moving through the environment here. This is how the AI director would modulate that population based on the survivor team's intensity we just talked about. So we start out over here. So there's a boomer. They dispatch the boomer. They deal with you know, these mobs, et cetera. You can see the, the intensity is spiking up. But they're still, they're all right. So as they continue on, we haven't really modulated anything yet. There's wanderers, here's another mob. This mob hit them at a bad place. Something happened. Maybe that smoker messed with them, et cetera. The intensity goes up too high, crosses the threshold, they go into relax mode. So in relax mode, <coughs> their intensity decays back down, and once it reaches this low threshold, wanderers start to appear again. After the relaxed time has elapsed, we're back into the regular population, starts back up again. There's a boomer and a smoker and a mob, and ah, oh, there's a tank, wham, right back up into relax mode. The tank works them for a while, keeps their intensity up high. But they take care of the tank, relaxes back down. There the wanderers start back up again, back into population mode. Now, in this case, this thing happened to work out such that they fell out of relax mode right in time to get the mob in the face. That's some of that um, structural randomness we were talking about, structural uncertainty. That's, that's good for that to happen sometimes. <clears throat> Here we move on. There's a boomer. This time the boomer hits someone, creates this big boomer mob. Spikes of their intensity, but not so high as to cause another relax period, and the rest of the population plays out. So if we compare the original unmodified population to the population modified by AI director, you can see in these areas here, like these specials, there are two hunters and a boomer that never showed up. This mob didn't happen. Uh, this is a little bit artificial because things aren't sort of plotted out at the beginning of the map. They're, they're computed on the fly as the survivors work through. But you get the idea where the AI director is going to modulate things and you end up with these sorts of, of peaks and then peaks and then peaks. So how do we procedurally populate this environment? How do we generate all those zombies and how they, they're placed, etc.? So we use layers of that structured unpredictability. And how do we populate thousands of zombies, et cetera, in a multiplayer game uh, in the source engine? Well, we, we reuse a limited number of entities. And the way we do that is we only populate the environment immediately surrounding the survivors via the active area set. And I am running behind, so I have to cook here. Okay. So 
Layers of structured un unpredictability create interesting populations. Sort of, in a, in a way, it's a kind of akin to Perlin noise, if you know what that is. Each of these layers, wanderers, mobs, special affected bosses, weapon caches, scavenge items, individually, their population systems are pretty, pretty simple. But we, we stack these randomized population systems on top of each other, and we end up with an interesting, robust population of enemies and scavenge items that are engaging to the players and can be modulated in a procedural way by the AI director via the mecha mechanism we just talked about. So the active area set, to do that, <clears throat> we make use of the navigation mesh. This system was originally created for purely for Counter-Strike bot pathfinding, but we quickly found that it's a great way to reason about the spatial area that you're in and to put attributes in the environment, uh, both you know, procedurally on the fly and manually. For example, we use a notion of what we call flow distance. Flow distance basically is zero where the players start in their beginning safe room, and its maximum value is in the safe room at the end of the map that they're on. So if you stand in a navigation area, if you move to the navigation area that's adjacent to you that has the highest flow distance from the one that you're in, you'll always walk right to the exit checkpoint. That lets us do some reasoning on things like, is this survivor ahead or behind? this point in the map. So we can make sure we spawn, you know, spawn tanks ahead of the team, for example. It's the active area set. We've talked about that uh, briefly. It's basically a bubble around the team where we populate the world. Here's an example looking down from the top of the subway. The yellow grid is the navigation area that, the navigation areas that make up the active area set. And you see as the survivor team moves through, the active area set follows them. So basically, as that active area set moves through the world, we delete things as they fall out of the active area set behind the team. We populate things as the active area set enters in front of the team. <clears throat> uh, populating mobs is done on randomized intervals. Um, we look for areas of the, in the active area set that haven't been cleared by survivors, are not currently visible by survivors, and uh, has some other constraints they meet. And then we create a mob there. Here's where we can use the flow distance. We usually create mobs behind the survivors because they're moving through the environment and they're dealing with all the wanderers, so they're usually focused ahead and they're taking out the enemy, so we want to sort of pinch them between those two threats. But we don't always do that because that would be predictable and we don't want to be predictable. There are a few other, other ways to create mobs there. Special infected, they're created at individually randomized intervals, unless it's a relaxed period. Um, the one constraint we, we loosen there is we don't care about cleared areas. We need to make sure these guys can appear, and they, we want them to be able to show up anywhere sort of around you. So we cheat a bit, and we let them sort of spawn in areas that you may have already cleared. Boss population, simple, simple algorithm. Basically, there's three cards, tank, witch, and blank. And we go down the escape path, which is, starts at the safe area where you begin and ends at the, the checkpoint you're trying to reach. And we shuffle up those cards, say tank, witch, blank, and then we shuffle them again. The only constraint is we don't allow two of the same cards to happen adjacent to each other. We, this has sort of been something all throughout the process we've tried to, we tried to avoid as much as possible. Avoid manually placed scripts and triggers. We did this early on in the project. We had a whole trigger and script system with monster generators and triggers and everything else like that. Um, we had many randomized sets where there would be three or four or five different possible sets every single run, but players are smart. They find, they figure that stuff out, and it just totally, it, it, what, what happened is it totally killed replayability because players learn all the scripts, they learn all the locations, and you, you lose the suspense of not knowing what will happen next. They'll come into an area and say, okay, they're there. No. All right, they'll be there. All right, they're not there. Get ready because they're going to be over there, right? That's totally not what we want with a game like Left 4 Dead. Worse because it kills cooperation. Because players then expect everyone to have memorized everything. And if they haven't, they get mad at them. Uh, and worse, it becomes a race. Right? So if you haven't memorized this stuff, then you're a noob and you can't keep up and I'm going to run on and I'm going to kick you out. That's not what we were after. All right. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. All right. Other supporting technologies. Uh, there are many things, again, there's just so much stuff to talk about, and, I, and there's not a lot of time. But there are many other things uh, that support uh, the cooperative uh, nature of Left 4 Dead. 
Uh, voice over IP, we've had in source for years. With Left 4 Dead, we added uh, open mic, um, so you can just talk. Uh, that was huge. I mean, that's one of the most natural ways to cooperate is just by talking to your friends. Uh, we added an in-game game instructor. Um, so, you know, you bring in someone who's never played the game before. They understand the basics, how to pick things up, how to revive incapacitated friends, how to rescue people, etc., without having to be told. It's very important. In-game in voting, it's, it's limited but, but critical. Right? In the event that, you know, you, you do get a jerk in your game, you, you really need to have a way to kick him out. Let the community police themselves. Uh, split screen was huge uh, on, the, on the Xbox. We really wanted to have that situation where you and a buddy on, sitting on your couch could cooperate together, and we, we got that there. Um, achievements uh, we continue to use to push game play. So in Left 4 Dead, we created several achievements that encourage specific cooperative actions and create reasons to replay the game uh, to try to get specific achievements. Um, we had a whole matchmaking system to team structured around the notion of groups that want to play together uh, because there's, it's a four-player game and not like a 32-player game like uh, Counter-Strike. And then, of course, uh, a whole new uh, AI system, uh, which controls not only a common effect, but a special effect, boss affected, and we can control survivors as well. That turned out to be huge, specifically survivor bots. Uh, it allowed us to assume that the survivor team was always four survivors. We had enough other variables. We didn't also want to have to balance for what if there's only one survivor? Well, what if there's two survivors? Or what if they're playing and two guys quit? Right, so we have these survivor bots that, while challenging to make, they let us assume this baseline. It also turned out to be incredibly awesome because it allowed us to do this, this drop-in and drop-out thing uh, online, which has been really useful. Uh, playing through a campaign can take uh, almost an hour. And, you know, sometimes someone's at the door or you have to take a restroom break or something comes up. Uh, you can just hit a button and then take a break and a bot will drop in with your current health, your current state, current weapons and play for you. And then when you come back, you can click right back in and take right back over. Uh, or if someone loses connection, et cetera, that turned out to be just really awesome. Uh, another really cool thing with uh, survivor bots is we're able to set up automated testing. We set up four survivor bots, start them in a mission, uh, crank the time to super real time, and let it run all night, and we can get thousands of playthroughs of our campaigns to find crash bugs and all sorts of edge cases and whatnot that way. All right, so in summary... Random players in the wild will actually cooperate if the game is structured to facilitate it and there's no way to cheese it. Uh, players really do like to help each other. If you give them opportunities, that's, that's a driving force. Like, you can use that as a mechanic to, to ensure cooperation. Procedural content was a, was a big win for us. Definitely generates replayability. Uh, is an excellent solution for replayable multiplayer experiences. Anyone who's taken a single-player experience that they've created and tried to make it work in a two-, three-, four-player situation knows what I'm talking about. Scripting becomes really complicated. <clears throat> Greatly multiplies the output of the development team. For several years, the beginning of the development of Left 4 Dead, the team was very small, um, less than 10 people. Having everything procedurally generated uh, was a huge benefit. Uh, dramatic anticipation is extremely powerful. Uh, structured on predictability creates lots of memorable moments. And simple algorithms create really compelling pacing schedules. Our survivor intensity is a really crude estimation of actual player intensity, but it gives us really excellent pacing. So do these techniques work? In the six months since we released Left 4 Dead, we've sold more than 2.5 million units at retail. We've received over 40 industry awards, and Left 4 Dead is currently the number one new IP on the PC and Xbox 360. So I think, uh, I think the data shows that that would be yes. <laughs> For more information, visit our website or send me some email. Thank you very much. And if anyone has some questions, feel free to set up some more. I had a question about the 30, 45 second relax period. Um, <clears throat> when I was playing, I was very, I, I kind of noticed that, like very specifically, and I wasn't sure. And I'm an AI programmer. I'm very into the idea of AI uh, managing pacing. So I wasn't sure if I was like paying very close attention to it. So I was wondering, uh, one, if other players had noticed generally, and two, what was the playtesting experience that led you to that specific kind of time frame? So the, the, question, uh, the question was, 
where we come up with the, the 30 to 45 second relax period. Um, and the, the, the answer is really play testing. Right? Just lots and lots of play testing. We played this game literally every night uh, for the last four years. Um, and it was basically tweaking the values until we found something that, that, that felt pretty good. So, but what were the effects of like too long versus like too short? Like Too long? Uh, longer than that, it gets boring. Shorter than that, it's too intense, right? People get burned out, and they just they can't, they can't deal with it. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for talking today. Uh, two pleasure. questions. First, could you step back a slide so we could see that email again? Oh, right. Yes, yeah. that would be a good idea. Thanks. There we go. And then uh, the other question is, one uh, survival horror thing that you don't do in Left 4 Dead, um, the ammo is basically unlimited. One ammo drop will save you half a map. So uh, why didn't you go with a more uh, limited resource for that? Right. Um, we really we kept everything militantly simple, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's only a handful of weapons in the game as well, uh, and the idea is that we wanted to focus on teamwork. The, the actual the game is not really about killing zombies, mm -hmm. right? It's about your teammates, um, and so we try to streamline everything as as simple as we could and keeping it compelling. And we we experimented with different ammo situations early on, um, but it just wasn't fun to run out of ammo. Cool. Thank you, you know, it just, so, so we, we, we opted for, for different mechanisms. Hi, yeah, great speech. Um, I was wondering more about this uh, structured unpredictability that you were talking about, and I noticed that the, the sounds are always the same, like for the boomer, for the tank, and I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on that. Right. So, if we're talking about structured unpredictability, why are the sounds for special infected like the tank? Why does the tank always sound the same? So I would argue that well, what I'm talking about there with structured unpredictability is when and where you encounter the tank. Not that the tank himself is different. It's actually really important that the tank not be different. That those sounds be the same every time. So the players hear that sound. Like, for instance, you can encounter the tank before he's sort of aware of you. You can hear him out there and hear him kind of breathing. Um, and that's a skill that we want to encourage. So we try to make each of those special infected very distinct. Like, we want you to know that's a boomer. We spent a lot of time, actually, trying to come up with, what, five different ways for zombies to sound, which is harder than it sounds, yeah. for them to all be distinct, right? How many different ways can you get a voice actor to go, <laughs> Cool. Hey, Mike. Nels Anderson, Hothead Games. Um, this is a very broad question and a little orthogonal to what you were talking about. But I was wondering if in doing all of this work about co-op, did you learn anything about creating meaningful co-op experiences that aren't based on combat mechanics? Uh, I know. Really broad. Well, you know, I mean, we intentionally went with the whole zombie horde thing because that was um, a fairly known quantity for us to do the risky co-op thing on. Right, but you know, like I would say, the, the the help things, like when someone's hanging from a ledge or they're incapacitated, um, or the sharing stuff, like how compelling that was was kind of shocking to me. Right, That's, those aren't combat things, but um, players really uh, really enjoy them to the point that the, I would argue there's a class of players that play just to help people. Right, just to like, be the guy who heals people. Cool. Finish that. Hi, great to talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about a lot of your stuff in the uh, a lot of your stuff seemed to involve pacing and like the delayed anticipation where you'd have like a, a queue and then a short delay and where people get a chance to say, Oh my gosh, what have I done? And then something horrible happens. I'm wondering what your thoughts on would be how much of this would translate if you had a game that wasn't performed in real time but were done with turn based. So how do we do this dramatic anticipation with a turn-based game? Well, you know, it just depends on how you've quantified time. So arguably with a turn-based game, it would be, you know, something that wouldn't resolve on that turn, right? It would be something that you did something on your turn and then, da-da-da, you are in trouble in five turns, right? Like, you know it's coming. You can't do anything about it, but now you have to plan for how to receive it. And then from what you've, from the research that you've obviously done a lot of on this, do you think that that would still create a compelling replayable experience? Or That alone wouldn't something? do it, right? That's like a, that's a mechanic to use to, to, to enhance the contrast, right? That's like, it's, it's colors to put on your, 
your canvas. You still have to paint the picture, right? You still have to, I would argue it's the structure of predictability. It's the, it's the total, is not being able to predict what's going to happen. That's what keeps people coming back to try it again and again. Thank you. Yep. Hi. I was just wondering if during the design at all you ever considered using player classes? Oh, yes, yes. Did we ever consider using player classes? We went around and around with this, right? Uh, we, we did some various experiments and whatnot, but again, it came down to sort of the, we wanted to just be as simple as possible, right? We wanted to be just as bare bones about, you know, it's you and these guys surviving the horde, period, right? You get into player classes, you get into stuff like, okay, well, I want to be the guy that can, you know, is move slower but takes more damage. Oh, well, that guy took that guy because it's one for Characters, right? We want to have duplicates and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to do there, right? But for this initial foray, you know, the thing is, every night we play tested, it was fun. Like, we didn't need to add that, right? So we really, you know, we, we did the, 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 the simplicity thing. We took away as much as we could without taking away anything more. I had a question uh, about the uh, random constraints for the timing and the spawning. I was wondering just about the, the authoring process. Was it uh, like a designer is using a tool? Was it a programmer like managing a black box? Like how were they authored? Very good question there. Uh, um, so how do we author these procedural experiences? Um, in Left 4 Dead, it was me in C++. That's pretty much what it was, which is not ideal. Like once, once we became part of Valve, that became a constraint, actually. In the early days, it was awesome, right? Because we'd come up with an idea, we'd do a tweak, I'd go blah, 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 and the code, bang, it's in all 20 of our maps. Instantly, we could test it that night, right? But then we become part of the larger organization. We have a lot more people that want to be involved, and there's this black box that only Booth knows how to use. I hate that guy. So <laughs> that's something we're, we're, we're working on. Hi. Um, as fun as the Left 4 Dead campaign mode is, and it is a lot of fun, I know a number of people who really enjoy playing the versus mode more. And while there are a lot of the elements that still play there, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the fact, the desirability of the competitive experience versus just the straight up AI based. Right. Yeah. So the question is, how does versus play into all this? <clears throat> Again, we keep on for hours talking about all this stuff. Versus for, for a long time, I this development. There was no co-op in Versus. It was always Versus. But we tried to make the survivors feel like they do now in the co-op mode. And the Versus players, the zombies, feel like they do now in Versus. And it was just really, really difficult. So we split them apart. Um, in Versus, we do some different things. Like, for instance, the ad director in a lot of ways to shut off in Versus mode because we, just, we want the two teams to just go at it and tear at each other. Basically... Uh, when, the, when the director said, hey, Mr. Zombie Player, survivors are in a relax mode. I'm going to unspawn you, and you have to wait for 90 seconds. They had a problem with that. <laughs> so uh, it's ongoing area of research. So uh, it definitely makes sense that you would pick survival horror to explore the themes of, of co-op. And I'd say you definitely nailed survival. How satisfied are you with the horror aspect? Is it as scary as you might have hoped? So is, is Left 4 Dead scary? Is it actually survival horror? No, it's not survival horror. But we gave up on that really early on uh, because scary, like creepy scary, is just not... We didn't find it sustainable, right? We, just, we didn't find a way to, to keep everyone, like, scared for that long of a period of time or to keep going back to the same environments and continue to be scared. What we were, what we were able to do is we were able to, to for them to be... Um, Excited, right? Thrilled. So it's more a survival thriller, I guess. Uh, I wonder if you ever encountered a situation where the AI director was trampling your concepts of difficulty with your easy, medium, and, and harder difficulties. And if so, how did you reconcile that? So does the AI director mess with difficulty? Um, so it doesn't. It doesn't. Because <clears throat> the AI director is reactive, right? So it's only going to back things off once the survivor team has been hammered, right? So, and, and the way Left 4 Dead works pacing-wise is the whole team usually makes it or they die, pretty much. I mean, occasionally you get some stragglers. And, you know, again, it's the one survivor that limps his way into the checkpoint and the mob is coming. Oh, my God, close the door. Let's sweep it. Those are the ones that people talk about. They don't happen that often. <clears throat> so it doesn't actually mess with difficult. Like, we don't change where the bosses spawn. 
We don't change how hard the zombies hit. So when that mob hits you, the director isn't touching that, right? It's just saying, wow, that mob really hurt them. I should back off next time for a little bit. But you have to be able to survive the first hit. I think we're running out of time, so. May I? Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I might have missed this in the presentation. Do the uh, weapons and health factor into the enemy spawning? Are those connected or not? Like if I get a big bunch of weapons, second tier weapons, am I then automatically going to get a big horde and tank and everything, or are those disconnected? Those are, those are almost entirely disconnected, okay. right? We, we, we spawn the, the, the weapons and whatnot uh, procedurally, more or less procedurally. We'll let the designers have some hand in where those things go, so there's some strategy to them. Um, and it solves some visual storytelling constraints, etc. cetera. Um, the one exception is the AI director can change pain pills into health kits. Okay, if, 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 uh, if, if the director is looking at the team and they're all just like worked and nobody has any health, then it'll change a couple pain pills in the health kits to try to keep the team going. But that's it. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks everybody.